Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mike Quaranta. I'm president of the Delaware State Chamber of Commerce, and it's uh, my privilege and honor to uh, welcome uh, Philadelphia Fed President uh, Pat Harker to our webinar today. And uh, just a couple of quick housekeeping uh, comments before we get right to it. Um, I want to thank uh, WISFIS uh, for being our sponsor today. Um, we always uh, are grateful to our members and our sponsors. And so uh, thank you to WISFIS for uh, stepping up and sponsoring uh, today. Uh, we have some upcoming events coming and um, there they are on, on your screen. We've got our uh, virtual uh, application workshop for superstars in business. Uh, uh, if you are interested in applying, I can't encourage you enough to attend that event. Um, it'll help kind of guide you through the application process. Um, as we prepare to make awards later in the year for outstanding small businesses. We have our, uh, um, my favorite event, um, uh, no offense, Pat, but uh, my favorite event is our Chamber Leadership Programs. And uh, we'll have uh, Tony Allen, president of Delaware State University, who will talk about his journey throughout his career. Um, I always find these to be uh, just super interesting. So uh, that's on uh, April 28th. And then, um, on May 12th, we'll have our uh, sixth annual Small Business Day where we will uh, talk about a couple of events, a couple, excuse me, a couple of policy issues that we'll raise with uh, members of the General Assembly and, uh, and other uh, Delaware public policy leaders. Um, okay, with that, let's uh, get right to it. Um, we, we welcome uh, uh, the President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, Pat Harker. His bio is easily found if you Google it. So I'm going to skip over that because you don't want to listen to me. You want to hear what he's got to say. So uh, Pat, uh, the, the, the next uh, 20 minutes or so are yours and we have uh, some questions afterwards. So thanks for being here. Great, uh, thanks. You can hear me okay, Mike? Yep, okay, good. So, and by the way, no offense taken. I mean, Tony Allen's a good friend of mine. I'm happy to let Tony take center stage. I mean, he deserves it. So no problem at all. So hey, he hello, everyone. It's really good to be back in Delaware. And thanks to the magic of Zoom, I didn't even have to fight the traffic on I-95 to get there. So I'm really, really looking forward to our discussion today, especially the Q&A portion. But before we get to that, I'd like to offer a few thoughts, a few thoughts on where I think we are economically, both nationally and specifically in Delaware. I'd also like to talk a bit about how we build a more equitable and sustainable economy as we recover from this virus. But before we do that, I need some housekeeping. I need to do one thing, the standard Fed disclaimer. The views I express today are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of anyone else on the Federal Open Market Committee or in the Federal Reserve System. So there, I am covered. You are my witnesses. So I last addressed this group almost exactly a year ago. And uh, at that time, this new normal we've all become accustomed to was still just that, it was new. Non-essential businesses were shuttered, COVID cases were spiking, and vaccines seemed only a distant, distant hope. Like most first year anniversaries, ours actually is a fairly happy one. That's because while last year and the early part of 2021 were really, really tough and tragic for millions of Americans, things have noticeably begun to turn around. And that's good news. Economic data like employment and manufacturing figures came in stronger over the last couple of months than many of us, and I'll put myself in that camp, expected. Now, while that's true, I am concerned about the downside risks from COVID variants and the alarming virus spikes in states like Michigan. But I still think that a combination of increased vaccinations, falling COVID case rates, and as you all know, a huge shot of fiscal stimulus should build the national economy. So for now, I'm expecting GDP growth to come in around five to 6% uh, this year or 2021. And I would expect the labor market to parallel GDP growth and unemployment to fall throughout this year. That's good. Fed policy, turning to Fed policy, we're going to stay on hold. We're going to hold steady. We'll keep the Fed funds rate very low and continue making more than $100 billion in monthly treasury bond and MBS purchases. So while the economic situation is improving, 
the recovery, I think it's important to note, the recovery is still in its early stages. And I don't think there's any reason to withdraw our support yet. Turning to Delaware, economic data for Delaware, meanwhile, indicates a real recovery is underway here as well. But it is very much a work in progress. Payroll data show that the state has recovered more than 60% of the jobs lost at the beginning of the pandemic but we're still around 24,500 jobs below where we were before COVID struck. That's enough for the unemployment rate in the state to have fallen from 13.4% a year ago to 6.3% now. Now that's encouraging, of course. Though in February 2020, if you can think back, the unemployment rate in Delaware was 4.5%. Labor force participation is similarly improving, but it's still down. It's still down from its pre-pandemic highs. It's, it sits now at 61.1%, up from last year, last April, 60.1%, but again, down from last February, 62.7%. So these broad numbers match various disparities across different segments of the economy, of course. Finance and insurance, collectively responsible for nearly 30% of Delaware's GDP, Good news is they have remained basically unscathed. It's really a remarkable development for those of us who recall the Great Recession of 2008 and 2009. Very different recession this time. The same cannot be said for tourism and hospitality, unfortunately. Net revenue at Delaware small businesses in the leisure and hospitality sector continues to hover around 50% or so of pre-pandemic numbers. But, even here, there are some hopeful signs. Rehoboth Beach, Dewey Beach area is reporting an uptick, an uptick in demand for weekend accommodations. And demand now, now outstrips pre-pandemic times. And that is a likely sign that people who may have traveled further afield in other years are now sticking closer to home. I know where we are. And job postings, open job postings in hospitality and leisure have been on the uptick for months. Manufacturing collectively, that's responsible for about 6% of the state's economic production, is also showing an increase in hiring, though it's still just slightly below the pre-pandemic trend. Now, in a sign of increased productivity, and that's what we're seeing across the board, we're seeing productivity numbers increasing nationwide, but here the manufacturing of chemical products as well as food, beverages, and tobacco products. That productivity is all up from 2019, despite a slightly smaller workforce. And lastly, it may be bad news if you happen to be a chicken, but it's good news for Delaware's people that agriculture has remained steady. The number of operating farms in the state really hasn't changed much throughout the pandemic. So a recovery is clearly underway. And I think with that comes a great opportunity for all of us. We can shape what's coming to build a recovery, a different recovery this time, that is equitable and durable. So let me tell you a little bit, if I can, about a new tool the Philadelphia Fed recently launched that I think you'll find really interesting and hopefully useful for your businesses and other organizations you're part of. Now, the tool came out of work done by our researchers at the Philly Fed and also our colleagues at the Cleveland Fed. They began by asking a simple question. How do we transition workers in low paying, unstable jobs into what we call opportunity occupations? And that is jobs that pay above medium wage, get you into the middle class, and that don't require a college degree, a four-year college degree. They came up with an ingenious idea, actually. They looked at the skill sets of people who currently hold these low opportunity jobs. Then they match those skills to jobs that would pay at least 10% more than their current wage. And again, that don't require a traditional four year degree. I find the findings were incredibly encouraging. Looking at 33 metro areas across the United States, they found that nearly half of lower wage employment can be paired with at least one higher paying occupation requiring similar skills. So for transitions, connecting the most similar occupations identified in the study, the pay differences actually are very significant <clears throat> with an average bump in wages of almost $15,000. $15,000, a 49% increase in salary. 
So we've recently launched an interactive online tool to help workers and employers, you all, make those transitions. You can find the Occupational Mobility Explorer by visiting our website at philadelphiafed.org. And once you're in the Explorer, you can select your geographic location and your current occupation, and you'll find a variety of jobs that require similar skills and pay at least 10% more in wages. So let me give you a couple of examples. I mean, I think the examples are illustrative. A receptionist here in the Philadelphia Wilmington area will find that they possess many of the skills necessary to become a medical secretary. And that's in high demand. A job that pays about 26% more on average. And that's a bump in salary from around $30,000 to $38,000 a year. A bill collector in the Wilmington area, another example, could bump their salary 45% from an average of about 38,000 to nearly 55,000 by becoming a credit counselor. With the added bonus, and there's an important bonus, that people will actually wanna answer the phone when you call. So the tool can also be used by workforce development practitioners, community colleges, other organizations, and of course, all of you. The Explorer can help inform your reskilling programs, employee recruitment, and hiring practices as millions of workers seek to re-enter the job market as we come out of this pandemic. And you look around and you just look around. There's a lot of talent out there that we'd be foolish to leave on the sidelines. We need to bring them in the game. Another factor that has driven far too many talented people out of the workforce is the dearth of childcare options. So the Philadelphia Fed in partnership with your Delaware Chamber is piloting a research and action lab. That's what we call them. And this one's focused on providing childcare options. And I know we're planning a full briefing sometime this summer. So I don't wanna play the spoiler today. So be on the lookout for that because I think it's really important. But I do wanna point out the economic costs that all of us incur when people, and let's be frank, mostly mothers leave the labor force because they can't find affordable options for taking care of their kids during the workday. This is a real issue. Like quality education, affordable childcare is not merely a nice to have. It is an economic necessity and it's an expensive one. Here in Delaware, it costs the median earning family, the median earning family, 20% of their income to pay for the care for a child under five years old, 20%. That is a very heavy burden, even before COVID, shuttered schools and childcare centers, further straining families. So making childcare more affordable, but it's a very complex issue, but one that surely requires our attention. I mean, look, already one of the most off-sited reasons for couples, get what they give for having fewer children is that they say they want, the cost of raising the children is too much. And lack of adequate childcare is driving some from the labor force. My colleagues at the Minneapolis Fed have done some research and found that at the outset of the pandemic, many parents of young children fled the labor force. 3.4% of mothers and 2.9% of fathers dropped out of the labor force altogether. But in the ensuing year, most fathers returned to the labor force while participation rates for mothers is still down 2.8 percentage points from before the pandemic. As with all those workers with skills languishing in low opportunity jobs, I think too much human capital is lying on tap. So again, thank you so much for having me here. Hopefully, God willing, I'll see you this fall when we go on and cheer the blue hens in person. So again, thanks, and I'm happy to take some questions, Mike. Great, thanks, Pat. Um, I won't, I won't tell, I won't tell Tony that you said the blue hens only because uh, as the president of Dell State, <laughs> on the Hornets and the Hornets. Uh, <laughs> there you go, there you go, there you go. Um, anyway, uh, all right, well, uh, terrific. Thanks. Let me let me get to um, a number of questions. So, um, and you, and you touched on a, a key one on childcare because. Uh, uh, we look forward to that work because um, it's an enormous issue um, for employers and, of course, by extension, their employees. And um, some of the tools that your team is coming up with are really innovative, clever, and smart. 
and uh, it's it's a real it's a it's a tough issue, um, and we uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Without, of course, as you point out, blowing out all the candles with the presentation that we'll make, uh, we'll have uh, um, uh, sometime uh, in the early part of summer. Um, but let's talk about this. You talked about a number of key industries here in Delaware, and um, let's talk a bit about international trade because obviously the Port of Wilmington is uh, a critical part of our future in the state. Um, and you know they've got some very aggressive uh, expansion plans. Um, I think they're the 19th most active port in the nation, and I know the management team there is hoping to make them a top 10 port in the next uh, uh, decade. So uh, with expanded vaccination efforts around the globe, supply chain repair, et cetera, um, what are we seeing with uh, shipping and trade traffic and um, uh, those kinds of uh, important indicators? Yeah, so what we know, what we've seen is there's um, a lot of issues right now with respect to uh, shipping and trade. I mean, you, know, you can just go to the port of Los Angeles, uh, you see the ships stacked up in the news and so forth. <laughs> so that will solve itself. I mean, the industry's working hard to resolve those issues. It'll get resolved. But it raises a broader issue of supply chain re-engineering. We were seeing that even before the, the pandemic hit. I mean, we were starting to see because of issues related to the previous administration and in China and now with the new Biden administration, we already saw uh, firms starting to think about how to reconfigure their supply chains. And, you know, I, I remember some data I saw a little while ago of a firm that actually helps firms re-engineer their supply chains and look for new suppliers around the world. And yeah, people were starting to move some of their production out of China, not everybody. And yes, the big winners were places like Vietnam and Cambodia and, and Spain, but also Mexico and the United States. So we started to see more coming closer, um, which of course, if more moves into Mexico, we're not necessarily talking about ships, but more rail traffic. So that I think throughout the, that would takes time. These supply chains are extremely complex. Uh, I know one story uh, of one manufacturer who told me this, he moved all his production of this pretty advanced engineered product out of China to South Korea. And he thought things were going well, but then the plant manager in South Korea called him and said, we got a problem. This one, extension cord, this one cord, power cord that goes into the product. Nobody else makes it but in China and I don't have any. And so here's this highly engineered, very expensive piece of equipment that's sitting on the dock because he can't get a power cord. So when I say it's complex, I mean, that's of all the things you would think about, the power cord probably wasn't top of your list in terms of re-engineering your supply chain. So that's why it's going to take some time uh, as firms reconfigure to a new optimum. Right, of what, and, but the other thing I think we've learned, and this is my old background as an operations management professor at Wharton. Uh, one thing I think we've taken away from this, we so highly engineered these supply chains over the decades that we forgot how fragile they can become, right? Often you so highly engineer, you get so specialized that you forget the fragility and the risks so I think now firms are re, reconsidering the risks and the fragility of these systems as they start. So I think the port still has tremendous opportunity. There's still gonna be international trade. We're still gonna be trading around the world. And I think the port has real opportunity here. Great, thank you. Um, um, the next, uh, these, are, these are very big macroeconomic questions, but, um, Let's see how we can boil some of this down. So um, housing, um, and you, you yeah. made reference to the, the Great Recession, um, um, but housing is always a significant um, uh, economic indicator, both ownership and also rental markets. And um, so there's evidence, some of it, uh, I think a lot of uh, anecdotes about people moving away from large urban areas into smaller uh, less dense locations. Um, uh, first of all, is that something that um, uh, you or your colleagues in other regions have actually seen materialize? Um, or 
um, you know, uh, uh, as some of our um, members have pointed out, uh, I think it was Chris Puccini told me in particular, he said, never bet against New York. Um, and so, you know, the yeah. question, you know, uh, do people are we seeing people move back into urban areas? Um, you know, and and the implications for all of that. But what does that mean for smaller urban areas like Wilmington, Newcastle County, and um, and the like? So a couple of thoughts on this. Um, first, we are seeing that trend. I mean, you see the housing prices in the exurbs, in particular, of uh, the cities. I'm sitting here in Haddonfield, New Jersey, right now, right across the river from our office uh, down, and anything that decently priced here sells almost immediately. And of course, lumber, and you're seeing all the indicators. That's why right now is a, a complicated time. Normally you'd see housing as a leading indicator of a recovering economy. It never lost steam during this. That's why this isn't a normal recession. This is a pandemic recession. And so you can't use the old metrics like we used to. I mean, you have to think differently. That's why we're using a lot of high frequency data, looking at you know Google trips and, and so forth to really try to understand what's happening with the economy. So I am, I actually would share a little bit of uh, Chris's skepticism because if I step back and think about what happened after the tragedy of 9-11 when people left New York, because they're afraid. We were legitimately afraid. I mean, it was a reasonable thing. But they did move back, and New York recovered. So I don't know. I think the, if you look at the longer run trends of us, the boomers, downsizing, us, the boomers, moving into the city, um, I don't know if uh, it's going to be everybody moving to the burbs. That said, I still believe, uh, and I'm still bullish on Wilmington. I think Wilmington, and I, with the commitment of Chris and the, the you all and the business roundtable uh, really has potential, uh, tremendous potential. And why I say that is there's ample evidence. Our regional economists at the Philly Fed and uh, elsewhere, one of our economists, uh, Jeffrey Lynn, has wrote, written extensively on this. I mean, one of the things that drives economic development is amenities. People, why do people move into cities? They want things they can't do in the burbs, right? They want a vibrant, cultural life, they want a vibrant restaurant life, they want, that's what they want, that's why they're moving in. So I think that's the opportunity for women. There's always a chicken and egg question, right? How do you get that if there's not enough demand? But I think Wilmington's perfectly positioned to take advantage of this. And I think a smaller city with those amenities can really thrive. So let's, um, let me go one more step further in this one. Um, remote work um, and, um, um, yeah, you know, high tax places, people, for example, um, we see this down in Sussex County, Delaware, a little bit in Kent County and also yeah, yeah. Here in Newcastle County, Delaware, where, you know, people are leaving uh, high cost places and relocating because if you don't have to necessarily be where you work, um, you know, what are the, what are the options um, uh, present themselves? And um, yeah. And what what kind of trends or what kind of what kind of work do you guys foresee you or any of the other uh, Fed uh, regions doing? Uh, kind of taking a look at the the implications of high cost places and people kind of moving around to find the best deal. So there's a lot of work going on across the system, and including uh, we're looking at putting a conference together in the fall on this issue, particularly around commercial real estate. What's the future of work? And there's mixed feelings on this. Some people say you know, th this is the future uh, of work. We're gonna work remotely or a hybrid way three days a week, maybe. But you know, if, if you've just gotten hired at the Fed or any of the companies in the chamber, uh, it's really hard to maintain or create culture of your organization via Zoom. It just is. The reason this works for us, and I can tell you at the Fed, it's a team that's been there a long time, we know each other, we work together. But imagine you're just a young person or somebody coming in from some other company and just plopped into your company. And this is all the experience you've had. You don't have those hallway talks. You don't have going out for coffee. You don't do, that's hard to maintain. So I'm in the camp, one of my old colleagues, Peter Capelli at Wharton, 
who's the third senior person in health, uh, human resource management. I'm kind of in his camp a little bit that the idea that nobody's going to go back to the offices, we'll see. I mean, the evidence is mixed. It's where, too early to have a, a definitive study. But at least some of the anecdotal evidence we're picking up from some companies, some of our contacts, is that productivity eh, has not been maintained, even though, or, or it has by people working crazy hours and sacrificing family issues. And they're willing to do that for a while. They're not willing to do that forever. So it's a big question on commercial real estate. What's going to be the future of commercial real estate? And you've got two competing camps. One says, well, uh, people aren't going to be there, so you need less space. The other is, oh, yeah, well, I'm not standing shoulder to shoulder in a cubicle next to the person next door. I want more space. So, you know, space per worker is going to have to increase. We'll see. I mean, this is still an open, open question. It's way too early to have a definitive answer to this. But I think it is, unlike housing, this is a big question that's sitting in every central business district as they're looking at lots of empty office space. Will people come back? We don't know. Uh, but I would be skeptical to think that nobody's ever going to come back. You're already starting to see some of the tech firms say, yeah, we really probably want you back. So, uh, so we'll see. I mean, it, it, we're going to study this, it, but we don't, it's too early to have the data to say anything right now. I appreciate that. I, I, it's a, I think you're right. It's an incredibly complicated topic. Um, on that same, uh, uh, in that same vein, let me ask you about, um, uh, and I thought the, the folks that uh, uh our, one of our board members from AstraZeneca had an interesting way. They talk about inclusion and diversity. If you're more inclusive, you will become more diverse. Uh, yeah. Kind of flip the terms around um, than what is uh, the norm. Um, do you think remote work uh, provides um, opportunities for companies to um, make more headway into uh, becoming more inclusive and becoming more diverse if, if people can be uh, connected uh, remotely, um, a, a topic of uh, uh, importance here at the Delaware State Chamber of Commerce, and you know one that I found yeah. uh, some interesting comments um, from uh, the uh, I think either soon to be retired Merck CEO, uh, who uh, is a native Philadelphian. Uh, what are your thoughts yeah. about remote work and uh, inclusion and diversity? So it's going to vary by the company, and it's going to vary by the role in the company. Take Merck as a good example. So if you're doing you know, office work, yeah, you could see getting more diverse people. But if you're in the lab, you gotta be in the lab, right? And so it's not gonna help there at all. And so I, it really varies by role. I think for some people, particularly this generation coming up, I can say my kids, the ability to do the remote work is a real benefit for them. They like it. Although they're starting to get a little tired of working out of home all the time. They want to go into office a couple of days a week. So again, I, I, I do think that by broadening the net and this, you, the ability to have more flexibility in how people work, it can only help uh, the inclusion and diversity. On the other hand, if you're not intentional about making sure those people have career progression opportunities, that is a problem because it's easy. We still haven't, as a, a management class, I'll put ourselves up in that category, really figured out how to effectively manage in this remote environment. So it's easy to forget about that person or pigeonhole them in that role and not mentor them and develop them in their career. So yeah, I think for a lot of jobs, it's possible. I do worry about the career progression for people uh, if it's only remote, because I don't get to really know you. We haven't had lunch together. I don't, you know, those things actually matter. We're human beings, they matter. Absolutely, absolutely, good point. Um, Pat, you talked about um, something interesting. I, I, I'm, uh, we did a whole separate session um, on uh, data and um, uh, the team here thinks I'm a bit of a data geek, but I love, uh, <laughs> I love data. We had uh, uh, the CEO of Brookfield Properties, uh, uh, out of Chicago, they own uh, Christiana Mall and a bunch of other malls. They're part owner now at JCPenney's as well. And uh, 
said, what, you know, what's, what's, what's your greatest next need in terms of hiring as a data analysts, but you just mentioned yep. something, uh, high frequency data. What are, uh, for, for myself and for everybody else who's listening, what, what is high frequency data? What are some of the new non, if you will, uh-huh. kind of the non-traditional, you know, there's the university of Michigan breadbasket of, uh, you know, yep. uh, home products, but what are some of the high frequency data tools that you're looking at, or you think are important? Well, so again, through this pandemic, particularly given that hospitality has been hit so much, things like open table reservations gives you some sense of the health of, in real time, the health. Uh, Cell phone traffic, you can see if people are actually traveling to work. You can see if people are traveling to shopping. You can see, you can actually trace economic, and again, the research here is early on, but you can correlate uh, those data with economic activity. And so they're really, and they're leading indicators because any kind of economic activity we get by nature is trailing, right? I mean, we're getting last month's or last quarter's economic data, but in real, almost real time, you can get the traffic patterns via cell phones, uh, you know, and other, other data. So there's a whole host of data sets that are now just emerging that we're starting to use and others are starting to use. I think that's really fascinating. And, and for all of our listeners, um, rest assured, I'm sure that all of that is anonymized, uh, but it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, it, very interesting um, and, and quite um, clever as well. Um, let's talk about uh, demographics. Uh, the census, uh, as we know, was just completed recently. Um, and we know that uh, Delaware a few years ago was the seventh oldest state in the union. And it's uh, chances are now we've moved up that list and maybe the average age here has uh, become a little bit older. Um, there's obvious implications there for healthcare costs. People use more healthcare in their sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth decades of life uh, than younger people. So there's you know, those obvious implications. But, you know, um, a CNBC story recently said, uh, uh, about since 2011 until 2029, I'm in the baby boom generation, um, about 10,000 people retire every day and uh, yeah. we're, we're losing a lot of uh, skilled workers. What are the other implications that you see uh, for a state like Delaware um, that policymakers ought to be thinking about uh, that go with an aging population well beyond the obvious, which is healthcare? What are some of the other uh, kinds of things you think we ought to be uh, working on and, and get to pretty quick? So a couple of things. There's a short, short medium and long-term issues. Uh, in the short run, what we're seeing is companies really trying to be very creative and flexible with respect to bringing people out of retirement and back to work. Um, so uh, I'll give you one example. One manufacturer that we talk to a lot uh, in the region, they have put on a pretty aggressive program. I mean, they, they have a hard time getting the skilled positions, the machinists and so forth. Um, so we need, they are being creative, like I said, in getting people re- who have retired to come back on a part-time basis with certain benefits that, that you know, they can entice, entice them back. I think I, we would encourage, I would encourage more of that kind of thinking because there's this pool of retirees uh, who may or may not like retirement or want to work a little bit. So an aggressive program to market to them, to bring them back with their skills is a short, short-term short solution. Uh, in the medium run, uh, it really is about retaining. I mean, Delaware is blessed with the universities there, you know, University in Delaware State and, and Delaware Tech uh, and, and others at Wilmington trying to retain that talent, I mean, in the state. Uh, and then I think an aggressive plan, this is a problem we're broadly beyond Delaware. The greater Philadelphia region has had that problem for quite a while. There was this great sucking sound to the north, to New York, right? So I think that with an aggressive marketing plan, and I think at least for Newcastle County, which is part of the greater Philadelphia chamber, uh, it, trying to market the region as a region that a region that is uh, very attractive to graduates to get them to stay. Uh, Because we're bringing all these people in, let's figure out how to keep them here. The longer term issue 
is for those who are not going to college uh, is to really focus on what I talked about, these opportunity occupations. There are tremendous job opportunities in the skilled trades. I'm the son of a pipe fitter, right? He, my dad died when I was nine, but I, I mean, I'm, my uncles, my brother, they're all pipe fitters and all had good, solid middle-class lives. Um, we need to start honoring those trades again and bringing those trades back and encouraging students. Now, this is going to be an odd thing to say as the former president of UD, but not everybody needs to go to a four-year college or a four-year college right away. There are other pathways to uh, a life that you want, and we need, to, we need to celebrate those. I mean, my electrician lives in my neighborhood, and I live in not the fanciest neighborhood, but a nice neighborhood. He's got his own business. He's his own boss. You know, that's not a bad life for him. Uh, so I think there's a longer term trend on getting people into the trades or other skill sets that don't necessarily require a four year college degree. We've sold so long. The only path to happiness is a four year college degree. For some people, that's absolutely true. For some people, it may be true, but not right away. Maybe they work towards that by, I mean, in some cases, if they get an apprenticeship, the company will pay for it. And we're seeing, by the way, apprenticeships, not only in the trades, but in IT. Companies are now offering apprenticeships with pay and paying for education in a wide array. And we have a report out, you can look at our website, that came out a couple of years ago on this trend in apprenticeships that uh, is healthcare, IT, it's not your, your mother and father's apprenticeship. They're very different. So there are different pathways to get that four-year college degree without that debt. And so I think we need to really celebrate the fact that we've got lots of different pathways that people can take. And, and we need to promote those. And that way we get the people we need into these skilled positions. The companies, I, that's the one thing I'm hearing all over the place. They can't find the skilled workers right now particularly in construction and manufacturing. Uh, we hear that, you know, in Delaware, um, uh, you know, the state chamber is the umbrella group for the Delaware manufacturers and the Delaware Retail Council. And I hear that up and down the state um, from um, a variety of industries. Um, couldn't agree with you more. Um, let me, uh, you know, there's a couple of things um, that I'm just kind of curious if you've uh, heard this piloted, but it, there are things that we're talking about and um, we're gonna talk more about it at our, um, the fall event that we have called Developing Delaware. We've, we've talked about, we've made a big push and a big focus of our work on workforce development and this skills mismatch that you just articulately yeah. talked about. Um, a couple of ideas, um, and I don't know if you've heard of these uh, in, from other places, but um, creating, if you will, kind of a tax preferred savings account for uh, uh, skills training as you go through your career, much like mm -hmm. an HS, much much like an HSA, um, something uh, uh, akin to that, and then also perhaps um, uh, the governor uh, quite strategically created, took some, diverted some CARES Act money into um, something that's called Forward Delaware and it's paid skills trainings in technology, healthcare, uh, some hospitality, the trades, uh, things where we know we have known deficits. But then what's the second level of training? How do we get people to take this from yeah. a job to a career? And um, there's an idea that's uh, uh, been uh, thought about at the uh, US Chamber Foundation about perhaps having, uh, once someone comes out of that initial skills training, Pat, they, they then, um, uh, the uh, initial state wage tax that is paid, payroll tax, is um, actually um, suspended and is used, uh, instead of um, being diverted to the state government, it's used to further that person's skill set for some period of time. So now they get the second or third level of training and they're, uh, they have more value to the employer. They've got more skills themselves. I don't know if you've ever heard of any of those ideas, but um, if you have, I'd be interested in your thoughts or yeah. any other ideas that are innovative like that um, would be. Yeah. Would be so there are lots of ideas. In fact, we had a major conference down in Austin, Texas, across the Federal Reserve System on workforce development. This is an area all 12 reserve banks and board of governors are actively engaged in different areas of research. Uh, we uh, in Philadelphia, uh, through our economic growth mobility project, 
have been really pushing this area as well. And one idea, and, and so there's lots of these ideas and they're all worthy of trying, right? Piloting to see if it makes a difference. The one that we've um, been piloting or been working on a pilot pandemic slowed us up a little bit with a major firm in the Philadelphia region uh, is to our knowledge, the first such pay for success model. What do I mean by that? We partnered with a nonprofit called Social Finance, who's been promoting these kind of innovative approaches. And the model here is this major employer is partnering with Philadelphia Works, which is the job board in Philadelphia. Philadelphia Works is gonna source talent uh, for this company, train them on a customized training program developed by the company and people in Philadelphia Works. And then these people are gonna be hired by the firm if they successfully complete the training. And after several months on the job, the firm is gonna reimburse the government entity for each successful hire. To our knowledge, this is the first such public-private partnership. And again, this isn't coming out of the company's foundation or philanthropy. It's coming right out of their HR budget. They see this as a way of doing two things, getting the talent they need, and back to the, the earlier conversation, and getting a much more diverse talent pool, because they're gonna to try to source people from Philadelphia itself uh, into these jobs. They also are taking some existing employees and upskilling them through this program as well. That's the plan. So there's a lot of innovation going on. And I would encourage as much of this as we can, but with the, the proper analysis of the results, because we're a very, like you, data results driven. So we want to make sure that these programs, uh, you know, they get evaluated uh, and make sure that they actually are paying off. But we think the pay for success model is one such one that can actually scale. Because the bottom line is the government can only do so much. But if the private sector hops in on these kind of ideas, th there's a potential win-win here and the scale can grow tremendously because the private sector, you know, I remember this number when I was back at Wharton, um, the private sector, if you collectively add up all they spend on corporate education, corporate training for their employees, that's more than the K-12 system in the United States. I mean, companies spend an enormous amount of money on this and it varies by economic circumstances, right? It's one of the first things to get cut in a bad time, you understand that. but there's real potential of engaging the private sector in this activity. That's a kind of a wow statement. Uh, that the, <laughs> the amount of money spent in corporate America on workforce training and development exceeds the collective budgets on K through 12 education. Well, yeah. that, it's dated, it's dated, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, but that's dated information, but it was at the time. Well, um, if it's even roughly right, that's still, that's still pretty correct. It's a big number. Yeah, corporate yeah. training budgets are big numbers. Yeah, yeah, that's wild. Um, you know, speaking of retaining talent, uh, 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 we have a, a very innovative program here that was uh, started by a couple of chamber members. Uh, a shout out to uh, our one of our board members, Scott Malfitano at uh, CSC Corp, um, and uh, something called Intern Delaware Pet. And um, so it's a um, so different employers around the state will have summer intern programs. And, you know, I could go through a list of names, but you know all of those big employers and even medium and small employers up and down Delaware. Um, intern Delaware is a program now that we house at the chamber. We bring everybody together. So all oh, the interns great. from the different companies all come together and kind of we have a curated program where they'll meet the governor. They'll uh, have a day at the beach. They'll have um, an opportunity to meet other interns from whether they're at Christiana Care or whether they're at m and or WISFIS or, um, or Purdue, um, they'll have an opportunity to meet other um, interns and develop kind of a friend network. These are a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times rising seniors with the goal mm -hmm. of getting people to come here. A lot of the participants and a lot of the interns from all these programs are from, um, uh, not just Delaware, so they're they're less familiar about you know living here, but they'll also then have an opportunity to see what it costs to live here as opposed to maybe downtown Philadelphia, mm -hmm. etc. So we're doing our trying to do our part to be creative. That's great. That's to, a terrific. Uh, to try to retain talent here. Yeah, yeah. 
Good idea. Uh, great idea. Um, let's, uh, I've got a couple other questions in, in the uh, time we have left um, from uh, some of our uh, attendees. Um, uh, Luke Tilly asks, are there specific risks you see that could lead to inflation uh, being uh, more sustained in 21 and into 22, 22 uh, instead of just being transitory? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's one, and of course, Luke, the former Fed guy, <laughs> he would ask that question. Um, it is one that's being actively debated, not only in the Fed, but across the economics and, and business uh, professions. So here's my take on this. So our forecast right now is we're looking at inflation for this year to slightly exceed our 2% target. We did launch a new monetary policy framework for the FOMC this past year, where we've said we're willing to let inflation run slightly above 2% for a while, so it averages 2%. And what's important there is, and I get this question all the time, well, how much more? Uh, it, what matters is not just the level, right? If it's a 2.5 and sort of creeping around 2.5, it's very different than if it's at 2.5 and roaring past 2.5, right? It's a different policy response. Uh, so it's not only the level of inflation, but also its velocity uh, that matters. So at, at this point, we don't expect inflation to be running out of control. Now, with fiscal stimulus, this is the argument, right? Lots of fiscal stimulus. We have to be seeing inflation come. Well, I've been at the Fed now almost six years, and uh, we've been anticipating inflation to come all through the recovery from the Great Recession. Uh, there are lots of reasons, whether it's technological innovation, globalization, um, competition that's, that's keeping prices down. Now, housing prices and rental costs have gone up a lot. Uh, but the rest of the goods and services bundle hasn't gone up nearly as much. Now, there are some, Luke, the point Luke is getting to, there are some technical reasons. There are some months of really low inflation are gonna be rolling off our 12 month average. So you're gonna see a spike. That's the transitory part of inflation. But longer run, uh, yeah, I think we want inflation to run slightly above two because we've been persistently below two. And not just we, the United States, every advanced foreign economy, Japan, Europe, uh, we has been running consistently below their inflation target. So we want some inflation but not out of control. Uh, that, so I don't, we're not anticipating it running out of control. There are some people who are very concerned about this, some prominent people very concerned about this. I take your argument seriously, but at this point, I don't see it. Secondly, uh, we know the tools to increase, to deal with higher inflation. We know this. What we've struggled with, and the we being the collective we, all the world's central banks, is when inflation is too low and we have interest rates that are essentially zero, we don't have anywhere else to go. So that's been our problem all along. And people have done different things, asset purchases, and, and we've done lots of things. But at the end of the day, uh, we know the risks of higher inflation are there, but we're better able with our toolkit to manage that than we have We've kept interest rates really low and we haven't seen inflation go up much. That's more of a concern in my mind. And I'm only speaking for myself, not anybody else on the committee. So I think we let it run and we let the, keep the accommodation. And by the way, as, as I said in my prepared remarks, I really want to keep the accommodation where it is for now because I still think our recovery is a little fragile. This question hasn't come up, but you know, what we were seeing today in the news with the Johnson Johnson vaccine, uh, which may fuel more vaccine hesitancy. Unfortunately, we're already seeing vaccine hesitancy and vaccine hesitancy, even with healthcare workers. I mean, one of the areas I've uh, gotten a lot of data on is healthcare workers who are reluctant to get the vaccine. If we don't get herd immunity, we don't get everybody vaccinated. And we're probably going to have to get people vaccinated again later this year or next year, just like we're getting a flu shot. If we don't overcome that, we're not gonna be able to get the economy fully back functioning. And we're seeing that, right? It's a very fragile recovery with the variants uh, that we're, we're seeing. So 
job one is we have to control this virus. And so right now, pulling back accommodation to me doesn't make sense. When you're in the middle of a situation like we're in, the fewer things you move, the better. We have time to move because we're not seeing inflation running out of control. If it, if it does, uh, we'll act accordingly. So related in part, um, David Hansen uh, asks the following, um, what's your opinion about modern monetary theory? At what level of debt to GDP, and you kind of just touched on this, will the Federal Reserve begin to be concerned? So first, I would say it's not just the Federal Reserve, but it's all of us and Congress and the administration. Um, so the ideas behind mon modern monetary theory aren't really modern. These have been around a long time, right? So we can print money. And, and as long as the rest of the world keeps taking our debt, we're OK. I mean, how do we know when too much is too much? When the world starts stop taking our debt? I mean, because I mean, that's, the, that's the obvious answer. When, when nobody really trusts that this is a good investment, uh, we've gone too far. Now, we want to avoid that. Right? We want to avoid getting there. So I tend to be, and I can only speak for myself, I tend to be uh, more of an old school kind of economist. That is, I do think deficits still matter. I do think we, uh, I, do, I do think making investments to increase the, product, the productive capacity of our economy make perfect sense. Um, you know, an old civil engineer or two. And so, yeah, the infrastructure is bad. We need to do something, for example. I stay out of exactly what that is. That's in the hands of uh, the fiscal side of the House, uh, Congress and the administration. But I think those investments in the productive capacity of our economy, whether it's broadband, hard infrastructure like roads, child care, anything that can get the talent into the workforce to, be, to make this country more productive is a good thing in the long run. That said, we can't just keep going on like this forever. At some point, that productivity has to pay off uh, in terms of controlling the deficit. Because what matters, right now you hear the argument, it's a reasonable argument. Given that interest rates are so low, why not? It's like when you buy a house uh, and you can get a really low interest rate, you can buy more house than if the interest rate was higher. If you get a 30 year fixed, if you, right, if you get an adjustable rate mortgage that's doing, you know, you're going to readjust in five or seven years, you should factor that in. That's my thinking about the deficit. Yes, while rates are low now, fine. But you really need to think about when rates start going up. And they will go up at some point. Now, we're going to be on hold for a while. But at some point, they're going to go up. And we need as a country to factor that in. It's not going to be this cheap forever. So it really is trying to get the productive capacity up, get our economy running at full tilt again, like we were before the pandemic. I believe I'm an optimist we can get there. Uh, at that point, we need to be a little more prudent in terms of our expenditure. So I think right now we need this expenditure to get the, the shot in the arm for the economy, but we can't be doing this forever. Agreed. Um... Last question. Uh, we've got about six, seven minutes left. Um, I'll wrap up um, in a minute and ask you for any final thoughts, uh, Pat. But um, this comes from Mark Talmo, who says, um, what's your long range economic outlook beyond 23? And what does the future of the stock market appear to be for the long term? There's a lot of people who've kind of commented that, um, well, I feel like I feel like the world's uh, smartest stockbroker because picking stocks has uh, been pretty easy the last year or so. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so what are, what are your thoughts uh, with Mark's question? So start with the, the second part. I will let the uh, market participants <laughs> decide about the actual stock market. Stock market is an important indicator for us to watch, but it's not the only indicator to watch. I think it's often, I often, often have to remind myself, um, the stock market is important, but it's not the real economy. What we're focused on is the real economy. Sometimes it reflects the real economy. Sometimes it doesn't perfectly. So we need to take that into account. Longer run, uh, it really does depend 
I mean, we've been on a 2% growth path to the US economy, if you look at GDP growth uh, for quite a while, that's our trend growth. And so unless we do something to increase productivity, we're gonna be on that 2% growth. There's only two ways to increase growth, only two ways. The fundamental equation of economics is to get more output, you need to either get more productivity, that is output per worker uh, hour, or you need to get more worker hours. And how do you get more worker hours? More workers. And so again, if you think back, and it's hard to think back before the recession, uh, this recession, as companies couldn't find, and even now, companies can't find workers. We were starved for workers. So my view and my view only, and I said this before the pandemic hit, and I still believe it. So if those two things are true, we either increase productivity, and hopefully these investments we're making will increase the productive capacity of the economy. That's the goal. But also we need more workers. And here, in my mind, a sensible, and let me emphasize the word sensible, immigration policy makes sense for this country. Uh, I won't go where what that is. That's not my job. That's in the hands of Congress and administration. But that's just an economic truism. You need to move one of those two variables or you're not going to get trend growth above 2%. And if we want that, we have to focus laser focus on those two variables. And that's what we're trying to do is uh, through our research and convening is focus on those two, but not the immigration part, because that's not our job, but on how to get more people productively into the economy who are already here, right? That's important. That's why this occupational mobility ex explorer is really important to us. We need to get more people into higher productivity jobs. I, I really appreciate you saying that, uh, Pat, because, um, you know, we've, uh, we're having conversations with the General Assembly. I'm, I'm gonna make a political statement. So I want uh, everybody to understand that uh, President, President Harker does not endorse anything about what I'm about to say, but um, you know, we, are, we, we really view that um, this march toward um, a higher minimum wage actually harms the very people it's intended to help. A better alternative is to put them into full-time aggressive training programs uh, because that is uh, the path to success. Um, we don't want to, I mean, uh, demanding higher wages just accelerates um, automation adoption and it harms the very people I think that we're intending to try to help because they do want to be lifted up. But if we really want to rebuild the middle class, we really need to be absolutely laser focused on workforce development, workforce training. And it's got to be a lifelong thing because innovation and change, things that happen in Shanghai are found out now later in the same day here. Uh, it's not like months or years later, like it was, you know, 50 years ago. Um, uh, Pat, you've been very generous with your time. Um, I'm just going to mention, and I'm going to ask you for any kind of closing comments or thoughts that you might want to make before you uh, uh, get on with your day. But uh, let me remind everybody, um, we've got a... Uh, a workshop on superstars in business, uh, the application workshop that comes up on April 21st. On 28th, we have our chamber leadership program with uh, Dr. Tony Allen, president of Delaware State University. Uh, and then uh, on May 12th, we have our sixth annual Small Business Day. Pat, again, I'm grateful for your time. Um, uh, feel free to wrap up as you like. Uh, appreciate your comments. Just many thanks. Uh, Delaware is near and dear to my heart, as you know. And, uh, can't wait until next time when we can actually do this in 3D and we can see each other. <laughs> there you fun. go. There you go. All right. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I hope everybody has a great day. Um, again, our appreciation to Philly Fed President Pat Harker for his time today. Good afternoon, everybody. Take care. So long.